Now, last week we talked about fear, and so many of us struggle with fear. But this week I want to talk about that. What's that? Don't say flowers. What sort of flower is it? Impatience. That's exactly right. So I, I can't grow impatient. I'm too impatient to grow impatience. And I don't know about you, but I want to talk about this. In my life, there's a glass ceiling of impatience. And, and it sometimes holds me back from what we're doing. We're, we're looking at King Saul and King David. In particular, King Saul had a real issue, a real glass ceiling of impatience. He just hit against it time and time again. <coughs> and I don't know, about, don't know about you, but I really need to hear this. Does anybody here get impatient? Yes, then we're, we're talking to each other here. So you've heard it once prayed, you know, Lord, give me patience and do it quick. You know, immediately. I need patience now. A young girl was praying with her mum one time and she asked the Lord for a new doll. And when the prayer was finished, she said she wanted to know where the new doll was. Come on, where is it? And her mother said to her, God sometimes takes time to answer us and that she should be patient. Great, says the little girl. I've been praying to an answering machine. Because <laughs> sometimes you feel like that. You pray and you just don't know, is it getting through? Is, God, are you getting this? Because the answer seems to not come through in our time frame. And some of us feel like that when we're praying all the time. Feel like God's not listening. For many of us, I believe God has planned great things. He has a great destiny for us into which we should walk. But we get impatient, don't we? And come on, am I the only one who gets impatient here? I'm getting impatient with people owning up to being impatient. But see, what we don't realise is he hears, he's lining things up and he's preparing the way for us. But we often get impatient and we act off our own bat and we take matters into our own hands instead of waiting and trusting him. Now, for King Saul, this was an enormous glass ceiling. In fact, this, was the, this is a pivotal moment in the life of King Saul. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8, let's have a look at it. Because what is happening here is uh, Samuel says to Saul, don't go into battle. I will come. I will offer sacrifices. Then you can go into battle with the Lord. And well, let's pick it up. Verse 8. Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. <coughs> but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. He was late. Samuel was trying to get there on time, but he couldn't make it. There were roadworks on the Bruce Highway. He couldn't get past. And so he was late. So Saul said, bring the burnt offerings here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered burnt offerings. See, Saul knew he had to wait. Samuel had said, you need to wait. You're not authorized to do this. You're not a priest. You're a king. You can't offer this. It's, it's, it's an insult to God if you do this. Don't do it. But because Samuel was delayed, Saul said, well, someone, we got it. I don't want to go, you know, someone's got to do it. Well, let's pick it up again. Uh, so Samuel arrives and says, what have you done? And this is what Saul says. And Saul, is, Saul was a really good dancer. He could dance around anything. He could offer a million excuses. Listen to what he says. Saul says this. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favour of the Lord. So I forced myself. I didn't want to do it, but I had to force myself to offer the burnt offering. That's his explanation. The Philistines could show up at any time and had to force myself to do it. So Samuel says to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord, which he commanded you. Uh, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You don't think impatience is a big deal. God thinks it's a big deal. Saul lost his kingdom and his life over impatience. It's not just a pretty plant. Impatience costs Saul his destiny, cost him his life, and it will cost us too if we are not open to listen to God. So <coughs> let me share with you a study that was done called the Marshmallow Study. Now those of you who study psychology would you know, be familiar with this. This was done at Stanford University in 1972. It's a very famous uh, study. What they did was they got a number of preschool children together and they were given a marshmallow and the following instructions. You can eat the marshmallow now, but if you wait for an unspecified time, if you wait, 
you will get two marshmallows. So that's what each preschool child had to deal with. It's called delayed gratification, and we don't like it in our society, do we? We don't like to wait to get what we want. So many kids, of course, look at this kid. I mean, he's just standing, like many kids were impatient. You know, they, they, they take the here and now over the promise of better things to come. And so do we a lot of times. Then researchers tracked each of these children over a number of decades to see what happened in their lives. And this is what they found. That those who could wait scored higher academically, were less prone to obesity and poor health, and generally achieved more in life. Their entire life was better when they could wait for their marshmallow. So... That's the power of impatience. It's not just a small thing. It's not just a small glass ceiling that we can easily remove. It is a major roadblock for many of us. Impatience. <coughs> so let me talk about the fruit of impatience. Patience is a virtue that carries a lot of weight. W-A-I-T, weight, not the other sort. And we, as we learn to be patient, you know, we can wait on the Lord. Who knows what this fruit is? Yes? It's not a jackfruit. Some of you will know, Raymond definitely knew what this is. This is a durian. Has anybody heard of durian? It's called the king of fruits. It is the smelliest fruit in the world. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It looks incredible. It actually tastes not too bad. Some people love it, but it smells abysmal. And in Singapore and Malaysia, you're not even allowed to get in an elevator with that fruit. There's signs up saying it is like... Don't go, in, don't go into an enclosed space with a durian. So there you go. That's the sort of fruit that we're dealing with. The thing is, as we learn to wait, patiently wait on the Lord, we can actually be renewed and strengthened and grow in, in wisdom and maturity. See, patience is part of his training for us. Isaiah 40 verse 31. We love this verse. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We love that verse. Those who wait on the Lord. See, when you wait, your spirit is renewed, even though you may not like it. And when you think about it, in Galatians chapter 5 is listed the fruit of the Spirit. And one of those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience... Patience. So the fruit of the Spirit is patience, which means that impatience is a fruit of the flesh. And what it can do is debilitate our lives and rob us of the destiny God has for us. I'm not over-exaggerating here. This is a major, major ceiling in our life for many of us. So let's talk about what impatience actually is, and then we'll talk about how we can shift that ceiling. The first thing is impatience is selfish. You see, at its root, impatience is selfishness. It really is. It's all about us. Impatience is all about us. It's not about somebody else. It's all about us. Don't believe me? Try getting on the road with a male. If, you, if you're a man and you drive a car, how many of you have got impatient on the road before? Come on. Just almost every time. And the thing I notice about it is it's always the other driver's fault. It's never mine. And they're always too slow, are they not? <laughs> Dave points to Julie. Julie points to Dave. What's going on? Yeah. She's more, she's the impatient one. But you know what I mean? You get on the road, especially if you're in a hurry, everyone's going slow. In the fast lane. What's with that? We're impatient with our friends. We're impatient with our family. We're impatient with so many. Why? Because they don't keep our time frame. See, it's all about us. Philippians 2 verse 3 says this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see, we automatically look to our own interests. It's all about us. I'm a guitarist. Someone once said, how many guitarists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Just one. He holds the light bulb up and the whole world revolves around him. That's what it's like for us. You know, guitarists think everything revolves around them. You know, and that's what it's like for us. We are so impatient. In fact, this would be the most impatient time in history. Today, if it doesn't happen fast enough, we just move on to the next thing. Experts tell us, and Time magazine reports, that the average attention span of a person on the internet is eight seconds. 
a goldfish is nine seconds. We are less attentive. We have an attention span less than a goldfish. That's embarrassing, isn't it? But that's what it's like. You have to capture people on the internet with your website or they're gone, just like that. Think about it. We have microwave meals, instant downloads and instant coffee. We have fast cars, fast foods and fast morals. In fact, I heard uh, the other day they've invented a microwave TV. You can watch the show 60 minutes in three minutes. That's, that, that's not beyond the realms of possibility, is it? Because everything is about time. And everything, we are so impatient for things. And this is the age of the selfie. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you didn't get hundreds of young people going like that, did you? This is the age of the selfie. We are so focused on ourselves that we don't think about other people and impatience is all about ourselves. Think about the selfie. Never before have so many photos been taken of so many people doing so little. Fiona and I uh, flew uh, back from China one time and we were in uh, Guangzhou Airport and there was a, a, a lovely, very pretty Chinese girl. She must have taken 200 photos of herself. You know, I mean... Who, who takes photos of themselves? Apparently everybody, because it's all about us, you see. It's not what I want. It's not waiting for what I want. It's what, sorry, it's not what you want, rather, or what God It's what I want. It's all about that. And so we're not looking to anyone's interests except ourselves. Impatience is very selfish. The second thing is impatience causes anxiety. Did you know that? When you're impatient, you are anxious. And we have more anxiousness. You talk to any doctor, there is more anxiousness and stress in our world than ever before. They're prescribing more medication for, for anxiousness among children than ever before. In fact, recently in the US, I was uh, talking to a youth pastor over there. He tells me he would estimate half of his youth group is medicated for anxiety. What is going on? And if you don't believe me that impatience causes anxiety picture this you're in a checkout line at Woolies or Coles have you got that picture okay there are people everywhere there are lots of people who need to check stuff out and they have two lanes open and they're all banked back and so you stand in this lane and there's the checkout person checking things through at glacial speed Beep. Beep. And you're going, get on with it. Proverbs 12 verse 25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Anxiety weighs you down and you sit there and it's like, beep. beep. It's like, man. And then, you know, the, the, the person in front of you checks a trolley load of stuff through. And you finally get to the end. You say, thank goodness, it's now my turn. And you're feeling a little less anxious. Then the guy at the front goes, oh, um, hang on, I'll just get out my wallet. And you go, dude, you've been standing there for 10 minutes. Couldn't you have got it out? Couldn't you have saved a few seconds? I'm getting anxious about this because I'm impatient. How many of you here relate to that? You're smiling, but you're sort of saying, that's really funny because my husband or wife is exactly like that even though I'm not. See, impatience actually has been measured to increase blood pressure. It brings about a release of stress hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol. It increases the risk of heart disease and causes many other effects. And eventually, if you do this enough, you get weight gain, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and an early death often. Shopping will kill you. I mean, it's, it's terrifying stuff, having to wait in line. Impatience weighs you down with anxiety and stress. But the Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 7 says this, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. We fret when we have to wait, don't we? It's very quiet out there. We do. The, the Hebrew word for fret actually means to heat or to burn. And have you been, you know, you're standing in that line and the guy in front is incompetent and the checkout person, or, you know, you're just about there and the second last item is like, can we do a price check on this? It's like, oh, are you kidding me? Right? And what happens is you get, so, you can feel the, your blood pressure rising and you can feel the heat rising, can't you? 
Your anxiousness, that, that's a good description, fret, because it means to burn, and you burn with this stuff. You know, and what we need, I mean, surely there is enough stress in life from the outside, we don't have to create more from the inside. But we do when we're impatient. The third thing about impatience is impatience causes disbelief. Impatience robs us of the results that we want. We start to lose belief. If what we are trusting for seems delayed, we start to think, well, maybe God's not going to do it. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 is a great verse for this. Habakkuk writes this, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. If God has, says it, has said it, <coughs> wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not delay. The more impatient we get with God and with God's plan for our life means the more chance that we will have of losing it. Because impatience is actually disbelief. Think about it. Impatient. When we're impatient with God, we're telling him, we don't think he can come through for us. I place a seed in the ground. I'm not a great gardener. I'm not a gardener at all. I've got a standard arrangement with the Lord. If I put the seed in the ground, it's his problem from that point on. I don't weed, I don't water, it's over to you. But if you place a seed in the ground, it takes time, doesn't it, those of you who are gardeners? If, you come, if I put a seed in the ground and I come back and check it every day, I dig it up again and look at it and then put it back again, it's, going to take, it, it's not going to yield fruit, that thing, is it? Because I keep digging it up. Oh, look, it's got roots on it. Cool, you know. That's a terrible way to garden. You need to put it in the ground and wait and have faith that that thing is going to come through. Not keep digging it up. James says this in James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. See, impatience robs us of our belief. And belief is faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. So impatience is not just, oh, yeah, no, God understands I'm impatient. No, this is a major, major uh, roadblock or glass ceiling to many of us. The fourth thing is that patience produces disunity. Ephesians 4, verses 2 to 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So you may not think it. You, you may just say, when I get impatient, that's just me. That's just the way I am. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. When you get impatient, you drive people away, don't you? Have you noticed that? People don't want to be around an impatient person. How do you like it being being in the car with an impatient driver. Do you enjoy that? Or would you rather be in the, in the car with a kind of a cruisy driver? Some people, you know, I remember being uh, in the car with a, with a taxi driver in, in Tijuana one time. And man, he was impatient. He was overtaking everything. He drove, he reversed up a, up a freeway exit. Can you imagine that? I said, you, what are you doing? He said, well, it's too far to go to turn around. So he just reversed up a freeway exit with people moving out of his way. That's impatience. And were we happy in the car with that guy? Man, I was glad to get out of the car with that guy. Alive. I wasn't sure I was going to be. When you get impatient, others pick up on it and trust me, they are not drawn closer to you. It causes disunity. The fifth thing is impatience causes impetuosity. That means acting out. Proverbs 14, 29, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is hasty in temper exalts folly. If you don't want to exalt folly, don't be hasty. See, Saul, he saw a need. Samuel didn't show up and he thought, well, I'll just solve God's problem for him. I will do it. I will do all of the, all of the sacrificing and stuff. It's okay. Sam's not here, I've got it under control. And we do that all the time. Impatience leads to impetuosity. We dive in and try and solve it ourselves. It's like when you ask your spouse for something. Ladies, when you ask your husband, could you please do this? Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. I've, I've said, could you take the garbage? Yeah, look, I'll take Please take the garbage. Yeah, look, I'll get there in a minute. In the end, you do it yourself half the time, don't you? Because you keep asking and you know. In the end, you just solve the problem yourself. You get impatient and you solve the problem 
yourself. See, Saul stepped in and offered an illegal sacrifice because he was solving the problem himself. He got so impatient, he became impetuous and took action. Now, sometimes it's good to take action, but sometimes it is good to wait for the Lord. The sixth thing (coughs) is that ultimately impatience causes loss. Saul tried to hasten things up. See, David saw victories in his life because, especially in the early days, he waited and he inquired of the Lord. But Saul didn't do that. He dived in all the time. Proverbs 19 verse 2 says this, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses the way. How many times have you dived in and realized after the fact that you should have waited? You ever done that? We do it in relationships. We do it in business deals and homes and cars and stuff like that. We, ju- we, you know, we just dive in a lot of times. And sometimes you dive in and the first thing, as soon as you've secured that item or whatever, you go, oh man, shouldn't have done that. Uh-oh. And you realize that you've done the wrong thing. Hebrews 10 verse 36 says this, you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. He's promised us stuff But we need endurance. We need to not become impatient. If we become impatient, we run the risk of losing it. So let's talk about, that's a little bit about the glass ceiling of impatience. I want to talk about how we can remove that as we wrap things up. How can we get rid of this stuff from our life? It's one thing to talk about it. And I know when you talk about impatience, we're all sort of, you know, looking at the floor and smiling sweetly and we're thinking, "Uh uh-oh. Because if you're anything, I'm really impatient. Is anyone here impatient like me? Look at that. A few of you own up to it. And the rest of you are in denial. Denial is not just a river in in, in Egypt. Denial is is because, you know, most of us, we are impatient for something. We really are. And so I want to talk about how we can smash that ceiling of impatience. Because I don't know about you, but I'm sick of hitting the same ceiling. So here's some steps on how we can smash that glass ceiling of impatience to move higher into our calling with God. The first thing is consciously slow down. We live in a fast-paced world. And even our leisure time, even the time we say, I'm going to sit down and relax, we are bombarded. If we watch TV, we're bombarded with ads. If we get on social media, we are bombarded with opinions. You know, we're bombarded with ads, pressures, opinions it doesn't matter what it is it's time that we actually disconnected from some of that stuff put our lives in flight mode for a while and just calm down and allow peace and tranquility to settle in our hearts not anxiousness and stress Fiona um, and I we have a caravan we like to take that out sometimes but but my experience is very different to hers when I get out there in the caravan I set it all up with a flurry of activity and then I sit down and say great it's set up What do I do now? Fiona says, read a book. Okay, well, I'll read a book for, okay, I've done that. What do I do now? Well, you know, I don't know, cook something. Okay, I've cooked that. What do I do now? I'm like, what do I do? And she says, stop doing anything. Just sit. And so I sit there and I sort of, you know, I sort of kick things around and I sort of read a bit and I sort of, it's like, man, slowing down is hard, isn't it? We run at such a pace, it's sometimes really hard, but there is incredible virtue in disconnecting and and consciously slowing down we talk about um, uh, peace Isaiah 26 verse 3 says this you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you we need to stay our mind on God and we need to come apart I was talking with Fraser during the week he has a company called Unplugged and um, we had lunch together this week didn't we and it was awesome and he he picked me up at my office and he took me to a park and we unplugged and we turned everything off He set an alarm and we had an hour just together, just fellowshipping in peace. And it's a weird experience, but it's a wonderful experience. His whole company is built on unplugging from life and getting recharged. And that's what God's saying. To keep your mind in perfect peace, you need to get recharged and then you'll be a lot less impatient. So what we need to do is find some peaceful moments in our day to disconnect from life. Maybe put the, 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 the phone on flight mode. Maybe, you know, turn the TV off. Just Even just sitting and relaxing and talking together can be so beneficial. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 says this, Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and striving after wind. I believe that the first step in breaking through the glass ceiling 
of impatience is to grab a handful of quietness today. Somewhere in your day, get quiet and, and quiet in your spirit. The second thing is to step back and see the big picture. See, much of our impatience comes from our inability to see the whole picture. We only see our bit, but God sees everything. In the Civil War, President Lincoln had an invention that he could use. It was called the telegraph. They'd never heard of it before. You know, there are, someone once told me there, there are three ways to convey massive amounts of inf information fast. Telephone, telegraph, and tell a friend. That's, you know, this is the telegraph bit. So they could send signals through from right across the battlefront. He could get a view of the entire battlefront from uh, his, his uh, centre there in Washington, D.C. Now, General McClellan was one of his uh, generals. And the general refused to obey any of the commands that President Lincoln gave him. Because he said, you don't, I'm on the front line. I know what I know. I see what I can see. I can make the decision myself. But Lincoln was saying, I can see the whole front. I can see how the decisions all fit in with the whole picture. And General McClellan said, no, I refuse. I'm going to make decisions myself based on my section of the battlefront. President Lincoln dismissed him in 1862. Because he couldn't work with that guy. Because every time he wanted to make a strategic decision that affected the entire war, this guy would make a decision based on his tiny area that he could see himself. Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 10 says this. God says this about himself. I am God. There is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. See God sees from the beginning from the end. He understands the entirety of history and where we are in history. We only see our bit. He sees everything. You only see your bit. He sees the lot. So we need to trust him. The third thing is we have to not only see the big picture, but we have to fight the need to solve God's problem. See, he's God and you are not. He sees everything. You see your small bit. So you must fight the urge of stepping in and solving God's problem as Saul did. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6, a very famous verse, and I love this verse. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It says trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on what? Your own understanding. But we do, we say God, you know, I, I know you're, you know, big and powerful and stuff like that. But I see this and I think I see a solution here and I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to do, so it's okay, Lord, I can take it from here. Let me solve the problem for you. And that's how we think. And we don't see the overall entirety of everything. And so we, we, it's very tempting to, to step in as Saul did and solve God's problem for him. Hey God, you should thank me because I'm solving your problem for you. The fourth thing is to develop a gratitude attitude. We live in a beautiful place, do we not? I mean, think, you know, think about all the places in the world you could live. This is not too shabby, is it? The Sunshine Coast, we love it. But the greatest sin of the Western world is an ungrateful spirit. And this manifests as impatience. You see, we usually don't count our blessings. We're just impatient for more blessings. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. If we don't get everything we want, we're whinging and we're carrying on. What does the Bible say? Psalm 118 verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will be impatient and demand more in it. Is that what it says? What does it say? Say it with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We don't take time out to be glad these days. If you develop a gratitude attitude... You can, you can weaken that ceiling of impatience if you are just thankful for all of the blessings that you currently have instead of demanding more. It's so important that we have a gratitude attitude and it'll smash that ceiling out of the park. The fifth thing, fifth step is to choose to trust God <coughs> and not man. See, like all of the ceilings that we're going to look at, they are stopping you from reaching your potential, from you becoming who God wants you to become. 
And you can let yourself be impatient or, like the other sinners, you can make a choice that you're going to smash that thing down. Psalm 27 verse 14 says this, Wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart and wait for the Lord. It takes strength to be patient. It takes heart to wait for God. But if we trust Him, if we truly trust Him, we will wait and God will come through for us and we will see incredible miracles. Now, waiting doesn't mean that you're idle. It doesn't mean you just sit down and you do nothing. That word wait in Hebrew means to keep doing what you're doing with an expectant heart. So you just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep, you know, serving where you're serving. Do whatever needs to be done. But you're expecting God to break through and answer your prayers. It means laying aside your agenda, your desires, your impetuosity and saying, not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Sweating, as it were, drops of blood. He's in agony there before his crucifixion. He could have stopped that crucifixion right there. But he wasn't impatient. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Because at the end of the day, he knew that doing the will of the Father was the most important thing. So I believe this morning it's time for us to smash that ceiling of impatience. Don't you? Some of you have waited a long time for the promises of God to come to pass. It might be for a loved one to come to church. It could be for an opportunity at work or an opportunity in church. It might be a physical thing like a car or a house or something like that. It might be looking for the right partner to marry. But Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. So some of you here feel like you're, you're groaning, feel like you're, you know, you're, just, you're getting more and more impatient. You're thinking about it. You're, you're ramping up and you're hitting this ceiling again and again and it's time for it to stop. Today I'm going to ask you what it is that you're impatient for. What is it that you prayed for and you believed for and it hasn't come to pass yet? What is it? We all of us have something in that area. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all come, should come to repentance. The Lord is not slow. He has his own time frame. His time frame is never my time frame. Is it yours? I bet it's not. My time frame is always faster. It's always faster than God's. But I've got to learn to stop hitting that ceiling. And just, I can smash it out of the park by making the choice to say, not my will, but yours be done. And I will wait. See, the hammer with which you smash this ceiling is called seeking and trusting God. And I know it's hard. I'm impatient too. I want everything right now. Do you? I do. I hate waiting for things. I hate planning ahead for things. When I was a young man, they started talking about superannuation. I said, nah, I don't need that stuff. That's miles away. Well, at my age, I'm starting to need that stuff. I should have thought of it back then. But I was too impatient. I don't want to put money somewhere I can't have access to it for decades. Well, now it's not decades. Now it's much closer. And I wished I'd have been less impatient back then. See, this is, impatience costs you in the end. I want a new building for our church. Does anyone here want a new building? Okay, we saw one slip through our fingers last week. Not really. We walked away from it because they wanted an irrational amount of money. And we thought, that's not, that's not possible. Okay, but that doesn't mean I've stopped believing God that he's going to provide for our church family. He just might do it from left field. I've got to wait and ask God to show me, not dictate to him what I think he should do. And that's hard. I've got some pretty firm opinions on this. I've got some great ideas. You probably have too. But I don't care what you think and I don't care what I think. I care what he thinks. And at the end of the day, I need to be less impatient about his provision for us and for our church family in the future. Lamentations 3, 24 says this, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The Lord is good for those who wait. I don't like waiting, but when I wait, the Lord is good. Can anyone here relate to that? It's true, isn't it? Some of you have had to wait a long time for something that you've been praying for and believing for. And if you, if you really believe it's God, you need to hang in there and keep waiting. They say good things come to those who wait. You know why? Because everyone else is impatient. And if you wait on the Lord, you can renew your strength. 
And I'm just, just looking around the room. I see people in this room who waited and waited and waited and they're glad they waited because what came down the line was good and awesome. So whatever it is you're waiting for today, we're going to have to give it to the Lord, tell him we trust him, we're trusting him and refuse to become impatient. Micah 7 verse 7 says this, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Can you say that with me this morning? Whatever it is you're waiting for, whatever breakthrough it is you're waiting for, is it something with your family, something with a partner, something with your your home or your business or your church? What is it that you're waiting for? I'm going to ask you, just take a few moments, bow your heads, and I'm going to ask you to ask God what it is you're waiting for.